Welcome to debate number 16. I'm Corinna from CADUS. CADUS is an independent humanitarian aid organization. As currently our biggest project, we're running a field hospital in northeast Syria. Besides from offering direct help, we are also active in innovation in humanitarian aid. That usually takes place at our crisis response makerspace in Berlin, which you can see hopefully in the, back now, in the background now. Um, the debate series started in the Makerspace, and thanks to the CCC Video Operations Center, it is now online. You at home can send us questions and participate in the discussion via the chat that you can find directly in the streaming site or on our website, cardos.org slash debate. And I'm quite excited that today's debate literally goes around the globe, and we are visiting Brazil. I'm speaking to Ricardo Ruiz Freire from the Global Innovation Gathering, in short called GIG, about making in times of COVID-19. We both already know each other from GIG and we will speak more about what that actually is in a bit. But first of all, uh, let me introduce Ricardo properly. So he describes himself as a vegetation enthusiast and has been part of numerous projects. For example, he is co-founder and designer of Tres Ecologias, Ecologias um, an IT consulting firm for the environment, education and culture, and also co-founder of the Centro Institute for Research in Media and Cultural and Technology. So the, the list of what he has studied is nearly equally as long as the projects that he does. Um, and among others, he holds an MA in Local Sustainable Development Management, and he is also currently a researcher at, um, watch out, long name, the Productive Infrastructure and Logistics for Sustainable Local Development Studies Group at the University of Pernambuco. So, Ricardo, a very warm welcome, and really nice to see you again. Um, and Thank um, you, I'm not sure if uh, you actually know this, but Brazil has been quite present lately also in the German media. There have been many reports about the severe situation regarding the pandemic. Just today I got from the news that so far more than 123,000 people died from COVID-19 and there are about 40,000 new infections per day. President Bolsonaro is in the critique for downplaying the severity of the situation uh, or even for using it for his own agenda. At the same time, he still has lots of support among voters. And just as in other places too, also in Brazil, groups of people who have already been disadvantaged before the pandemic are also in a really tough position now. Um, but as I know from you, Ricardo, and from our friends at the Geek Network, People are also getting organized and helping themselves. So I'm handing over to you now, Ricardo. Please tell us about what is happening in your place in Brazil. Thank you very much, Corina. Thank you very much, you all. Uh, thank you very much, people from Cadus, for inviting me for to be part of the debate. And uh, I will start to show you a little bit the work we've been doing with Casa Criatura. Uh, and Casa Criatura is a maker, is an in innovation hub in the city of Alinda, that is in northeastern Brazil. Uh, the city of Olinda is very well known for its cultural practices. So you see on your left a picture of the carnival, and the carnival is quite famous in Olinda, and it runs all around the streets, and it's an old heritage site, not just because of its buildings, but also because of the cultural production of it, no matter if craft is work or music or different cultural traditionals based in Afro-Brazilian traditions. Uh, Olinda and Recife, as you see in the picture from the bottom on your right, uh, they are separated by a river and 
On the horizon line you see the city of Recife with big buildings and is the capital of the state. And just across the beach you see the city of Olinda. Uh, these both cities during the colonial time have been fighting to get control of the colonization process between Portuguese and Dutch, but at some point with so many wars and the colonizers leaving the seat from times to times, Olinda became a very known place for resistance in Brazil because most of its population are black people mixed with indigenous people. Um, despite of this cultural heritage and lively livelihood, uh, Olinda is also has also a lot of problems because it has one of the worst ages on the country. So, oh, let's come back here. So this is the scenario of where we are working on. Uh, these are the fellows from Casa Criatura, and Casa Criatura is an innovation hub just like many innovation hubs around the globe. And before the pandemic, it used to have some restaurants and cafes, some meetings and discussion panels, music presentation and things like this, but also make a space with 3D printers and a small laser cutter. Uh, and then in beginning of January this year, the famous year of 2020, uh, as part of a global innovation gathering plan, Casa Criatura is started to work with one of the projects of GIG. And what is GIG? GIG is a group of innovators from all around the globe, and it's also an NGO based in Berlin, but with the associates from different countries, and if I'm not wrong, it's more than 550 countries, the members from Global Innovation Gathering. Uh, the members go from uh, working from things from Defy Hate projects online to Peace Hack camps in Colombia or South Sudan. Uh, we also run a project called I4 Policies that discuss the way people can intervene in Pan-African political scenario and some other projects, but the project we started to work in Casa Criatura, it's called Carryables. And Carryables is a project, it's an cons international consortium uh, with different European institutions, but, but with labs running methodologies all around the globe on how can we use digital production to better care of ourselves and of our neighbors. And before the pandemic, this was very centric in people with disabilities, uh, but uh, the pandemic brings some, some new perspective to the project. Uh, on, on the left side of your picture, of your screen, you can see people developing a stadiometer during one of the workshops. So Carryables is also a good website where you can have many different things to download and print to your community and to help others and to care better for ourselves. But with the pandemic, with we, as many other makerspaces around the globe, we start to develop face shields. Uh, and with the support of Carables, Mozilla Foundation, and also from Cadus, we could start donating these face shields to different institutions, no matter if health authorities. So, in the picture on your right, in the bottom, uh, these two girls, they are from the health secretary of Linda, and uh, the doctors on the top, they are from the city of Recife, uh, also from a public hospital. So we donated in total around 5,000 face shields uh, and the one in your left is very special but because this one 
This was the donation for the health authorities for the indigenous communities in the country. Uh, we could donate some face shields to the districts of Pernambuco and Portugal, but you can imagine that we have many indigenous health districts in Brazil. So the one I told you is just this small one here and here. This was the district that we could manage to donate it. And even though we tried to make a bigger donation to, to the national organization that takes care of the indigenous health sector, they said they were not able to get the donation and to do quite the logistics to distribute it very well because they already distributed some face shields. Uh, but we also need to remember, just like Corina said, when we talk about today's Brazil executive power, it's a military government elected by the people. So, in a way, we are still trying to figure out how can we reach more indigenous communities with better support. Um, we also develop a different model of aerosol box than the ones that have been developed around the globe, especially the one from Hong Kong, that is quite famous in the makerspace. And the problem with that aerosol box is in the corner of it, it's exactly where the doctor looks to the patient. So it was not very good to look into the intubation process. So we worked together with two different medical hospitals and we could design this model that is very light because it's using acetate, I think it's the name in English, and uh, it also has some support for hands, for, for, for not spreading out the, the goticulas, oh god, uh, and it's also support from Mozilla Foundation, and it's available online on Welder, so everyone can download it and use it, and we had also a special look to the what we call it the demuni. The demuni is the Latin word for the people that are part of the comuna, the people that are part of the common of the citizen, and the immune, the ones that are not part of the comuna, the ones that friends of the kings, the ones that don't need to pay taxes, the ones that don't, uh, they are they are part of the noble those are the immunes. So we decided to design for the demuni, the ones that will not be able to get the vaccine so fast, especially if you go to the peripheries of the peripheries of the globe. Uh, this vaccine will take some time to reach there and how can we also take care of the population and take care of ourselves. So basically, Corina, this is the work we've been doing in Brazil. Uh, you have some reference in here, in these three websites, where you can have more information about the work I talked here tonight. And I think that's it for now. You can contact me on the email, Twitter please, I don't have Instagram, and the web blog. So, back to you, Corina. I was wondering, though, so how is, how is Casa Creatura in general doing now? Because you said that before you have, um, you had a cafe open and um, all, uh, a lot of public space and isn't it that the the income for such a place also comes through a cafe is it still open or did you have to close it and how's the financial situation at the moment uh, yeah thanks for the question uh, we had to close the cafe and the restaurant during the the time and uh, now the situation in Brazil is quite crazy because sometimes uh, it looks like it doesn't have a pandemic running around the globe. Um, 
you can like now in Brazil it's around half past three o'clock and in about 15 minutes maybe you will start to hear some noises in front of my house because people are heading to the park so they can exercise themselves but most of people are not using masks uh, and I had to travel last week to go to the countryside to solve some personal situation and in some cities on the countryside people are not using masks at all and people are on bars and on the streets so in a way um, Brazil is such a big country and when you start a national security law saying everyone must stay home you don't take uh, in perspective that many cities in Brazil you take five seven eight days to arrive depending on the transport you are using you can take even longer so in a way uh, the lockdown in the countryside it happened too early and people stay at home for longer with no cases in any cities and as soon as the cases were running low in the capitals running low in the capitals uh, the government started to open one or another city and at some point cities in the countryside decide to open themselves again and then the coronavirus started to spread on the countryside so the situation it's it looks like a wave you know from from the capitals to the countryside uh, and to to some places that are very very far away from some central spots you know some central seats with airports and things like this so this is what is happening now it's a mixture of people using and don't using masks believing and don't believing but the commerce is already opening again and we open part of the restaurant we mix it the restaurant with the bar with the cafe uh, and now it's just one thing in the front of the casa criatura where people can arrive and take away some food you have just one or two tables in the front uh, people can order something but it's not like just like before you have maybe someone one day and someone the other day uh, so we decide to focus a little bit more on local production just like you said uh, so these 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 hats that we we develop for the population in a way it's it's helping us and and we also selling the the face shields um, because most of the donation do not reach all the health sector with the speed it is necessary so we are we were selling it for three euros so in a way we change it for a more uh, cultural entertainment business to a more local production lab great so you are uh, basically all the casa creatures still able to survive um, uh, well how um, but you, i saw on the website that you are also um, doing the the plans for the face shields as open source is, is that correct that if people wanted they could produce them themselves according to your plans too yes uh, the face shoes the aerosol box and the hats the the the, the turbo it's all online on welder welder.app uh, uh, we think it's there's no other sense for local production if not uh, with open source modules you know uh, you can't imagine local development without open source modules for printing or for developing or even without open source software so in a way we we 
we use the products from the community as well so it's more than our responsibility to share it back and despite of that especially because it's medicine it's about people's health we believe it's it's extremely important to have all the knowledge in science all the knowledge in products to be open all the knowledge in in uh, pharmaceuticals to be open and to be free and available for everyone uh, especially if you go to the pharmaceuticals and patents most of it or a lot of it come from plants and those plants are part of nature and we are part of nature so it makes no sense at all to have this proper medicines you know we are talking about human's health how, how is it in general actually the the access to um to to medical care and to medication is it that um usually mostly all people in in brazil can access it if they need it or is there really big differences can you say anything about that <laughs> Yes, mm. there are huge gaps, you know, there are huge financial, social uh, uh, assistance care, there are huge gaps in Brazilian society, and just like many societies around the globe, uh, and there's some interesting case that I've been hearding so there's a friend she's a she's studying medicine in the south of the country and her mother she's also worked in the secretary of health of this small city where they live and she was telling us that in the local hospital they just have one specific medicine and the doctor should prescribe this medicine for everything so no matter your problem if you reach to the public hospital they will prescribe you the same the same medicine it looks insane but yes it happens uh, and you also have some gaps for example what what is the huge problem with indigenous communities is when you are indigenous in Brazil, so and you can auto declare what you are in Brazil. So you, you Corinne, you can auto declare you are black, because of this history of three hundred years of raping in Brazil. You cannot say the color of the mother or the color of the grandmother of that person. So you are the only one who can say where you are from. So when you are indigenous and you are out of your territory, you don't have documents. So you cannot go to public hospitals, you cannot do, go even to private hospitals. Because you, you, if you are indigenous in Brazil, you are, the, the nation is your tutor, something like that. Uh, so one of the big gaps which is with indigenous in the peripheries of the big cities so when you watch into the into the, the presentation that I showed you and I come back to the specific slide where I talk about it let me see oh okay i will not trust in computers so if you look into the brazilian territory and if you look uh, uh, the indigenous community you have a lot of indigenous community near big capitals and you have a lot of indigenous people that leave your community to go into these big capitals to walk just like everyone else in the world and uh, once they are there they they don't have access to anything so this is the kind of gap we are talking about you know we are talking about of the gap of for example the peripheries of the the big cities or the brazilian the 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 black afro-brazilian population that has a huge lack access to healthcare sector or to healthcare institutions uh, 
so the access for everything is very very difficult for some part of the population you know and especially nowadays with pandemic and how the huge oh here it is so just to inform you know so this is this is one capital this is another capital you know this is another capital this is another capital uh, here you know, people that people don't don't believe you have some strong indigenous community around here especially Guaranese you know if this mix with Paraguay Argentina and Brazil so those are some of the gaps that we have in Brazil to health access you know and the situation it's especially the biggest problem now in the peripheries is Population's hypertension, salt and sugar, mm. as like the most responsible for killing people in Brazil nowadays. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, you, you shouldn't forget over COVID nineteen that there's also general a lot of illnesses that kill people if if they have no access to medical care. Um, we actually have a few questions in the chat which uh, fit very well the um, the topic we've just been talking about. So um, there's a one double question for you, Ricardo. Um, uh, someone in the chat asks, should the state do more to protect indigenous people from COVID-19? And do you have any concrete suggestions what should happen? Uh, all right, thank you very much for your question and thank you everyone for all the questions. Um, should the state do more? This is a tricky question because the answer will never be yes or no. Uh, when I think about the state, you know, uh, it's such a mix of things. So I will do a very classical example for myself. Uh, I've been involved in some cultural projects uh, during the beginning of the 2000, uh, part of the Brazilian Ministry of Culture on the time, under the, the Labour Administration. And we could develop a project that at some point become a national law uh, regarding state supporting local cultural production all around the country and it was a really nice project and it worked very very well for 15 years but after the end of the labor administration we could realize that we didn't look into the sustainability of the projects and this is a special thing. We thought on that time that the state with the big S would be responsible to support the cultural production of Brazil during the eternity. And this does not relate it with the way capital walks around the globe and I'm not saying with with judgment oh I think the state I think the capital I think the companies but what we see are different um, configurations of power uh, no matter with the no matter if the the social software in the Chinese you know the Chinese social software to you uh, evaluate your neighbor or, or the way the city of Barcelona is trying to deal with their data or the way people are, are pushing forward the capital industry because of the Black Lives Matters movement so uh, what I think is that we really need to understand the indigenous needs first of everything you know so 
I don't think if I, I don't know if the state should do more, but nowadays the state it is not helping, and this is the the problem, you know. Uh, once indigenous communities in Brazil, once traditional communities, and when we say traditional communities, it's all this mix of population that during the colonial times used to run away from the big capitals, big colonial capitals and go further in the forest and mix with the local population. And when you think about Brazilian population, you should always think about this kind of miscegenity. Oh, difficult word. Uh, and we should always uh, try to understand what are the real needs of these traditional communities, this mix of people that used to be fishermen, used to be Afro-Brazilian population, that uh, uh, Brazil had an independent republic during the colonial times that most of the world doesn't know nothing about it, not even the Brazilian population, that it was called Palmares, and here it was a symbol of uh, rebellion, but people really doesn't understand it as another country that we had inside Brazil during the monarchic times. So this population are the main target of this executive power today, this state today. And no matter the legislation in a country like Brazil that had this kind of uh, Urbanization process, colonization process during the last 500 years or 300 years, no, no matter when you think about that, uh, you do a legislation and when the government changes, this legislation changes. And so when you talk about state in Brazil, you are really talking about government because the state changes in different governments. Uh, so maybe what can be interesting is how can we develop tools so indigenous communities for example the tupinambas in the south of bahia how they can uh, how can state government big industries population can help the cocoa industry inside the indigenous population they grow cocoa in, inside the forest, they have a really nice way to deal with the, the, the production and they produce very few amounts of cocoa and just they sell it to Switzerland. So how can you ignite different models that does not depend just on the state and also does not depend on destroying local population? Uh, to put farm and cocoa farming around, you know. So I think this is the main question, and not the the what the state should do. I think the state should help. I think big companies should help. Mining companies should help because what is happening now, especially if you go to the here, if you go to this area, Alto Solimões and Vale do Javari, where is having this mining problem in Brazil and go there, uh, indigenous people themselves together with mixed population and big money and age stand, they are, they are mining by themselves. And the kind of mining they are doing, I'm not saying it's, it's less or more sustainable than the kind of mining uh, Vale does. Vale is the biggest mining in Brazil and probably someone that invests in the stock market invests in Vale. Uh, I'm not saying the way these indigenous people are mining are better or worse than the way Vale is mining, but they are illegal. They are illegally mining the, their own earth, you know? And this government said, yes, this is right. Indigenous populations should have the right to mine their lands. Uh, so what you see is a two, a two radical spectrum where you think what a state could do and continue being tutor of responsible people around the globe, around the, the country. And what mining inside the indigenous community do? You know, people are allowed, allowed to mine inside the territory. 
no, they cannot do anything because the state are the, is the tutor of them. You know, uh, I think we, we should always avoid the situation of X or A, you know, black or white. It's not about that. And what can be concretely done? Uh, I think maybe, maybe uh, to give more access to, to power, to knowledge, to this traditional, to this contemporary knowledge, to have some way of structuring society and way of compensating uh, the problems we created around these 300 years. And if you look here, uh, it's clearly the Brazilian colonization. You see where are the indigenous, you see where they are not. And they are not, not because they are killed, because they are mixed, because most of the indigenous girls have been raped for 300 years. And more than killing the indigenous population in Brazil, it's been a cultural killing. So you take this, you, you take this as part of your culture. Your culture is not that good. You take, so what was the first great mission in Brazil, which was the Jesuist? You know, look, your culture is not that good. Uh, you can become my culture. You can become me. And then you look to tons, loads of Brazilian people and uh, to you that walk around indigenous community and look someone in the city and said, look, you are Patachó, you are Tupinambá, you are Kayapó. But people say, no, my father, my grandfather, he's from Italy or he's from Portugal or whatever. You know, so when you look at the policies in New Zealand on how to deal with the Maori population and how to deal with this just three generations that had arrived there uh, and colonizing the Maoris, come on, you know. So I think this is more concrete situations, how Chile deals with Mapuche population, uh, sorry. The way Mapuche population uh, have their, their seat on the Congress, the way the political is, is oriented around Mapuche population in Chile is also an option, is also something we could look at, you know? And it's not just indigenous populations, it, it's, it's the ones allowed to be raped. It's the ones allow it to get the virus. 40% more of the deaths in Brazil are from black population or poor population. 40% more. Just like the United States is the same and probably all around the globe. And now I, I, I was watching the news today and now is, is Mumbai. It, it, you know, the virus got into the peripheries of Mumbai. And even more crazy to think about this virus is when it goes into this traditional community and it kills the elderly, no matter if an Afro-Brazilian fisherman, the drummer girls, or what traditional community we have in Brazil and goes there and kill the elderly, you kill the root of that population and you keep the colonization process of killing the cultural heritage of the people. And this is what is happening in Brazil now, today. This is the situation we are facing. Thank you, Ricardo. That was really a lot of information. Um, um, yeah, but that's, <laughs> uh, in the end, um, a lot of times an issue also in other places, which you have already mentioned, but um, the, the right of indigenous people to, to the country they're living on. And you mentioned the mining. Um, and I... Actually, I also read something about mining in Brazil in the connection to the spread of COVID-19 to indigenous communities. Um, so it's, yeah, I'm quite surprised, or well, not surprised, but it's um, really a shame that they're not allowed to mine on, on the indigenous land when at the same time the Brazilian state or the governments um, give out mining claims, gold mining claims, 
um, to other companies and then the problem is that um, the the miners come into the indigenous areas and uh, they transfer the virus to the in indigenous areas like this this is at least what I read uh, maybe you have different information but um, no, this is also happening, you know, because it's huge. So you have this situation I told you is just like the Alto Solimões in Valley do Rio Javari. And but if you go to all the, especially the, uh, how we call it in English, the people that have no contact with, with all the population, uh, those are now getting content with mining miners and not company miners. You 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 can think about even illegal mining. Myself can go mining. Uh, it's quite easy to mine in Brazil. If you go to the forest, you have gold in many places, diamonds. So it's a mixture, you know, of big companies, small, small legal companies, big legal companies, small illegal population. It's everything. It's it, it's a gold race, and when you get the space in between the gold, then you have the farming. You know, the white space is on the map. Uh, if you look on my screen again, and if you look at the white spaces on the map. This is where Amazon is burning, you know, if you look here, here, this is where Amazon is burning. Uh, so when it's not mining inside the forest, inside this indigenous landing, people are burning outside the indigenous landing to, to grow soya and, and to grow meat. It, it's no secret for anyone. It, if we eat meat, in a way, we are part of it. Not just we, you know, if we are in 20, 100 people here, but we are talking about billions of people eating meat every day. You know, there's one small city here, uh, here in this red thing, it's called uh, São Félix do Xingu. Uh, the municipality, the area of the municipality, uh, I think it's it's the size of I don't know you know like it's huge it's one city the size of a country in Europe and they have two billion cattle heads there two billion we are we are 200 million people in brazil but just in one seat we have two billion cattle so this is the thing it's huge brazil is quite huge you know the situation here in the north is, is completely different from the situation in the south and this completely different situation in the north uh, especially because it's quite impossible to manage a country of this size with just one federal constitution. It's very difficult to have the same law here in the north and the same legislation here in the south. And this is what happens in Brazil. Uh, and this just don't work, you know? No matter if mining controlling, farming controlling, health disease controlling we have a central power that takes decision for everything and if you go by plane from here that is the capital of brazil to here it's like six seven hours you know i i reach from recife to lisbon in seven hours and this central power takes care of everything so and then comes again should the state do more no i think the, sh the state should be divided you know but this is the first federal crime in brazil i, I can be arrested for saying that uh, uh i will come back to the map because then it's it's easier to explain oh no i'm already on the map oh nice so uh just like i said uh I will start with my perspective on this connection, this communication. 
Uh, we've been working for a while with indigenous community from this area that is called the, the, the first meters, you know, because they are the first one to meet the Europeans in the beginning of the, the 15th century. Uh, so, and in this region, we work with the, the Tupinamba community and a little bit with the Patasho community that we have contact there as well. Uh, uh, in this same state of Bahia, we have some nice connection also with another community here that is called Tumbalala. Actually, it's here. Uh, uh, because in these three communities, another two communities here from, from Pernambuco, so in this axe that you see here, we have some contacts because we've been working with radio production uh, and the cinema production for I don't know maybe 10 12 years now around it 8 to 12 years I'm, I'm not sure uh, so basically we used to go into this community with an FM transmitter or with some other workshops with using free media uh, free software media uh, and to develop some communication projects with these communities, you know, and after this workshop we used to leave the FM transmitter there and leave it for a year and through social networks, you know, these terrible WhatsApp groups or Facebook group, group, groups, uh, we keep, kept the contact with them to see, okay, will you keep the, the transmitter? We need to take it to another community. What are you gonna do? Do you want to buy another one? We know people who sell and these things. Uh, and after some time, we start also to develop uh, workshops to produce podcasts and also film and do some movie screening inside this, this community. Uh, so this is basically the community that we work more because we are friends, you know. Uh, uh, I, I talk with, with, with Tupinam, with Jaborangi, one of friends to stay at his home with my son because want to travel these things. Uh, uh, we are friends. We develop a friendship during the living, you know, uh, and they have a huge struggle, especially here in Tupinamba, huge land struggle. They are trying to, uh, how can I say, authorize their land. So they they used to live there and then someone arrived and said now there are laws on this land and they are trying to get their land under these new laws for 350 years now. It's just a bureaucratic process and so their, their chief is one of the most hated indigenous leader in Brazil that is called Cacique Babau, especially by the federal police and this new government. So, so the communication in this area of the Northeast is quite easy and the Southeast as well because uh, indigenous communities call themselves parents you know, and then you talk with someone and said, do you know someone in Minas Gerais state? Oh, yes, I have a parent there. Oh, do you know so? Uh, but when you cross this, this space, and this is more older than the colonization, this cross here, that is the drought area, you had some indigenous that b before the colonization, the most of the Brazilian population that are the Tupis, they travel from here through the Amazon to here and through Paraná here and then they start to go through the, the coast and populated the coast and, and, and managed to conquer the other indigenous communities in this land. So most of the Tupi language people, they came from this part here and and no one never leave it here so much because this is so dry, you know, this is dry if you have a nice place to live where it's a forest, why to live in the dry, you know, so uh, to reach these communities is more difficult. We also work with, in Xingu once, so we have contacts in Xingu, 
and Shingu is something incredible that just happened when the state tried to do something without listening to indigenous. At some point in the beginning of the 1950s, if I'm not wrong, people decide that, uh, okay, let's solve the indigenous situation here in this state. Let's close a piece of land and bring all the indigenous communities together in that land. And this is Shingu. So in the beginning, you have a lot of problems. To be indigenous is not to be yourself. You have to be connected with your land, where the tree was, where you've been born, and where people have been buried for long years. So it's not to change yourself. You also have problems with another indigenous community. Sometimes you get a big genocide, and we have something like ten or twelve genocides inside this land when this happened. So yes, this is how people try to deal with indigenous population here. Uh, so it's more difficult to communicate with this area, but we can now communicate with someone from Manaus in the capital of Amazon state and it's an NGO working with these indigenous people that are away from their village they are living in the city of Manaus, in the peripheries of the Manaus. So this, this is some of the community we, are, we can reach. We also have a national, a national, um, a kind of national group to deal with the indigenous community, a national NGO dealing with a lot of indigenous communities called it APIBI. But uh, the, the pandemic make everything more difficult. They are not able to travel to the indigenous community, so they are not very aware what is happening everywhere. But you see, uh, indigenous communities are everywhere. So you can you can talk with some of the communities. You cannot reach very well some other communities. You know, uh, uh, you have indigenous communities living just like the way people think. But you also have indigenous community in the coast. So this means that you have indigenous surfers or you know indigenous cocoa producers and the things like this. So. Uh, it's it's a mix of different things. You can reach some indigenous communities, and some indigenous communities are not that reachable. And the first question about the needs of these indigenous communities it's also very interesting because they are in need of everything. You know, so I think it's I can reply it with another question: is what do you have to support and how can we make this reach some of these villages? I think it's, it's the best way to understand it, you know, because it's... You, you, you always should take away that vision of uh, uh, a place with a house of, a house of wood or a house of uh, straw, you know? You have some communes like that, but we are talking a lot of different communes that live in houses, that live in like rural areas, that use clothes, that have internet connection, but that say they are not Brazilians, they are they are Cuiabás, they are they are whatever you know. Uh, I'm not Brazilian, I'm Portuguese, and uh, this is what we are talking about. So there are many necessities how can we reach what are the communities you want to reach you know and how can we help those communities what what you have to support if it is just maybe just talking about what is going on in the places would that be of any help boycott brazilian meat all right boycott brazilian meat boycott brazilian soya boycott brazilian agroindustrial products I think it's 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 one huge step, you know. Uh, boycott the European Union Mercosur deal because it's in a way we need some external strong pressure in the pocket of the riches, you know. Uh, also, in a more local level. Uh, maybe try and select some communities, reachable communities, and start a dialogue with these communities to see, look, uh, I can support you with this and that. 
what do you think is useful you know because in a way everything will be useful you know so it depends on us to 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 not pollute that much you know to to not bring more virus to all those things that we know you know how how can we what do we have to support and what those communities are in need you know they are in need of territory they you know they are in need of basic health care really basic health care some of the indigenous communities they are they are in need but they are also in need to be listened you know they are also in need to be understood uh, some people like to live naked some people like to live in clothes and then this should be understood you know and maybe this is the point what do you need how uh, from the things i have to support how can we understand your needs you know in the needs of land in, in the need of health care in the need of basic knowledge you know so so one of the the things we've been discussing with uh, with people inside the Tupinamba land is the problem of the privacy on web you know because they use this traditional tools to communicate and the federal police want them arrested so if they leave the territory federal police can arrest them if they are inside their territories federal police cannot go inside so and those people use a normal whatsapp group you know and and use it to as activists too normal facebook groups so one of the things we are discussing now is how can we develop this project of uh bring the knowledge of these more security tools to communicate more security tools for privacy you know uh, and it's all parallels healthcare land uh, uh, communication you know all the education uh, and not this education from the 16th century but you know like uh, digital education how can you use these tools better you know so maybe we can we can try to offer and this is really a nice thing uh, in a way it's become a costume no not a costume sorry this is not a word in English it's a tradition uh, to change gifts with indigenous and uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm Brazilian, so I, I'm happy that I don't need to consider myself a white man. You know, I can consider myself what you call in Brazil, pardo, mulato. Sometimes I consider myself black, I consider indigenous. You can do that. And this is quite nice. Uh, so, all, all, all those, I lost here, but all those, those levels came together, you know, how, how can we support? So, oh, all right, the, the changing thing. So, this, this tradition of come to the indigenous people and change gifts, it came from the Portuguese and it's, it's lived until now. It's a tradition and people like it. So, maybe we can try to start with this tradition. Let's change gifts. You know, and maybe this is an interesting perspective, even in the storytelling of the thing. You know, uh, let let's let's change gifts. You know, uh, I have this to offer, and I want a music, or you know, I want you to keep your language or whatever. Yeah, the, crazy stuff. There's really a lot of ways to to keep working and a lot of good ideas there um, we are that that hour just went so quickly <laughs> um, but we are nearly at the end um, Ricardo thank you very much I would like to ask you one last question um, what what are your plans and, and Casa Crea Tours plans in, in the um, close future do you have any projects coming up or what will be your next steps can you say anything about that 
Uh, we are now starting to prepare a presentation on Carryables project because it's it's been the end of the consortium project, you know, the consortium contract of two years. So we are celebrating, in a way, the success of Carryables. So we are preparing this exhibition in Casa Criatura, but also maybe in a public hospital where people are circulating much more than in Casa Criatura or in one of these hospitals, uh, school hospitals that we work in. So we are starting to think you know, on that, how can we organize better that, you know, this presentation. And we, we will also try to keep going with the Carryables project, you know, we think this is really interesting the way we could help more population, so we'll try to get more funds for work with Carryables in a local scale and also helping GIG to search for funds for Carryables in a global scale, because just like we had some nice things happen in Brazil, we had some incredible things happening in Nepal, uh, also in Ghana, uh, uh, India, so in Italy, so I think we want to focus, at, at least me and some others in Casa Criatura wants to focus a little bit more on, on digital making and healthcare, you know, because it's been quite intense, quite important, and it's, in a way, it's a life-changing work, you know, when you, we heard so many times that we are helping saving lives, and this is so nice to hear, uh, you know, just like you said in the beginning, it's been 130,000 deaths, and uh, we just, could manage 5,000 face shields, but then it's 5,000 lives, you know, and this is quite, quite life-changing, so this is something we really want to follow on. And thank you very much, Corina, and thank you, Carlos, for all the efforts you are doing to try to help our indigenous community here. Of course. Um, Ricardo, thank you very much, and really the best of luck to your projects and to the whole Gig and Caribels network. It's, uh, it's actually really great um, to, be, to be part of that, and um, well, I'm very much looking forward to also meet you again in, in the Caribels and Gig network. Um, thank you very much for being here today and for um, putting really a, a very sharp spotlight on the situation in Brazil for us and also in, on the, uh, the activities of the people who are uh, getting ap active to help themselves. And I would also and I would also thank very much very like much, to Karina. thank um, the VOC technicians in the background who have been really working hard to make this happen and thank you very much. Um, uh, well, thanks to you all at home also for watching and for participating uh, with uh, questions. I'm sorry I couldn't uh, take all of them into account. Um, but yeah, thank you all very much and see you next month at Carlos Debate. Goodbye.